Okay, this one's a little bit more my speed. Playing in the dirt, digging holes. <laughs> so this is the building panel. Welcome, everybody. And uh, let's see. Bear with me for a second. I'm going to pass this over to Eric. So uh, something on a follow-up to Sawatch County's unique situation in regards to building codes we have fought like mad to keep UBC uniform building codes out of here because we want the freedom to build our homes how we want, out of the materials that we want, out of trash if we feel like it, which is recycling in another word. Um, the idea that we should be able to choose these things and not have it imposed on us I think is, is really important. And I just need to clarify that we have actively fought and gone to commissioners' meetings and fought against building codes because we want this freedom. And we're willing to take the risk and responsibility that comes with that. So, yeah. Go Swatch County. And also, for those of you in Colorado, know that there is a very legitimate, very well-written gray water regulation that we can all start adhering to, which hopefully we'll be making some videos about here very soon. Um, okay, so we have a variety of people who have done and are involved in a variety of projects. So let's just make our way around. Um, we'll go ahead and start with Tony, since Tony already kind of gave us the highlight. So uh, we'll start with Tony and what you're working on and what your wall systems are like. He's got a mic right there for you. Hey, everyone. So I, um, I decided to build with structural insulated panels, uh, SIPs, and I gave a little presentation on that. But they're basically um, basically an insulation system, um, sort of polystyrene foam or neopore foam, uh, sandwiched between OSB, and the homes are actually um, all uh, drawn and engineered. They're cut on a big... Um, cab machine that can be any shape or size, and they uh, they have the highest um, energy retention system of any building system that there is, and I am, um, I will say this, I use, the homes I build are um, Energy Star, if you believe in that. Um, they save you a lot of money on energy costs, which I'm sure you believe in, and I am, um, I will succumb and say that I am very jealous of the people I'm going to pass this mic to because if you are interested in green building from a standpoint of recycling and reusing your available resources, um, these are the people that uh, can open up your eyes. So I'm going to pass the mic. Thank you. Quite well. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Jeff Demers, and um, I grew up with a uh, a, a father uh, who worked the majority of his career as a, as a carpenter, um, in in did jobs ranging from you know his position being a superintendent to um, you know down to to just a journeyman carpenter. Um, so I grew up around straw bale building, and. Um, my first experience with it was, uh, I was probably about uh, 12 or 13 um, when my dad was building a straw bale house in Guffey, Colorado. Uh, came here to Crestone um, to build my own straw bale house uh, and um, had a great great experience with it. Uh, and yeah, part of, part of the uh, beauty of living here and building here is is not having that um, universal building code, even though Straw Bale has gained more acceptance. So with that, I'll pass. Hey, Jeff. Yes. You did something a little unique with that Straw Bale structure you built. Uh, it was round. And it was two stories. And it was two stories. And load-bearing. And load-bearing. Load so load actually, bearing. Th three unique properties. Yeah. <laughs> minor, minor details. In minor details, but we'll, we'll get into that later, maybe. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Hi, I'm Goldie, and my partner, Matt, and I have been building an Earthship here in Crestone for the past three years. Um, so Earthships are a structure that's been perfected by the architect Mike Reynolds down out of Taos for the last 40 years. And their basic design is tires as the walls, which also act as the foundation. Um, they're heavily insulated. They have a lot of thermal mass. Um, 
and they catch their own water. They treat their own sewage. They have food production. Um, they're built using recycled materials. And I'm missing a couple of the other principles right now, but they're really amazing. So. Hi, my name is Suzanne Rouget, and I am a certified hemp builder, and we work with Hemp Herd, and I um, <clears throat> really believe that this is a movement that could move forward in this valley um, as we need to uh, look at how we um, compensate for early snows that take out your crop and you can still look at the biomass as a viable means of um, revenue. And there are a lot of really incredible attributes of hemp building and I'm sure that when the questions get rolling I'll be able to answer some of those. My name is Sean King. I actually uh, currently reside in Sacramento. Um, I intend to live here in Crestone at some point, seeing what the path to that is. Uh, I build with Cobb, and um, rather than build for people, I mostly build with people and teach people how to build their own homes with their own hands on their own sites. Um, and um, a lot of my experience is in running intensive workshops where in nine days people with no building experience get the, um, the information and experience that they need to go forth and start their own home projects in wherever they are. Um, and these um, models have been pretty successful. There are a lot of uh, cob homes that exist as a result of these kinds of workshops. Um, I'm very interested in building that is um, extremely local, literally under your feet, uh, materials that are on site. Um, I'm extremely interested in a building style where I get to see and feel my impact. So it's my hand on the tree cutting the limb that I'm going to use as part of my roof structure or whatever. I'm the one digging the hole um, or harvesting a rock from my site. So I get to make all the decisions. And if you feel strongly about this sort of thing, um, I get to ask permission directly to the materials I'm using, those sorts of things. So I'm very interested in cob and natural materials and um, have been kind of collecting and playing with um, and using information in that area for, um, well, it's 10 years now. I started in 2010. Um, and I'm freely available to anyone who has questions um, before, after, during. Please ask. Brad Allen, thank you guys. Appreciate the introduction there. Um, let's let's start with um, let's start with the materials and the the basic uh, basic building precepts, basic concepts and uh, materials used. Um, describe the the construction system itself and um, how it, how it all ties together. How it. Um, yeah, how it comes together into a into a full building. You want to go ahead and start since you've got the mic again, Sean? Sorry. Sure, I'll go right um, straight ahead. Um, the building materials are uh, clay-rich subsoil. So um, that means soil below the root zone where there's minimal biological activity going on. Um, an aggregate, usually sand, but other things could potentially work. Um, and a plant fiber, uh, usually straw, but you can use other materials that are strong when you pull them and that don't immediately break when you bend them a little bit. Um, the way the system works is that you build a foundation out of the materials that you wish to do that with. Um, that can be natural rock or recycled concrete chunks are really good for that. Uh, so there's a whole foundation system. Um, mostly what I teach and work with is gravel trench foundations, which are fabulous for drainage. That turns your foundation system into a drainage system for your building so you don't ever get water under your building, which can be really important for your health. And as we go through um, climate disruption and climate shifts, uh, we're going to see more and more extreme precipitation events. So it's going to be more and more important for a building to be able to get its water away from it. Don't let it get under your building. Um, mixing and combining the materials is just water um, and you can use tarps. You don't have to use machinery. Um, and you dance in it barefoot. It's fun. You get to dance in wet, squishy mud to make your wall material. Um, one of the things that delights me about the wall material is that it's freely sculptural. It's sculptural from the time you the first put it, began building the wall all the way out. You're always inside a sculpture. You can make sculptural decisions as you build, change things, do it all with your bare hands. Um, no sound of power tools, no ear protection. None of that's necessary. 
Um, and in the end, you get to live inside a sculpture. So instead of relegating art to being something that's on the side that we sort of appreciate from a distance, you build it with your flesh and blood, your, your bare feet, your bare hands, and you get to live inside it when you're done. It's a, it is a beautiful process. It feels great. And that's part of why I'm into it is because it's joyful and I'm interested in the pathway to sustainability and a more beautiful earth and a more healthier earth that is joyful and fun and gets people excited um, because that's the kind of motivation that we need um, to really get things to happen. Um, so anyway, I'm diverging a little bit, but it's uh, you're basically piling up mud, but not quite so crudely. You have to integrate. The straw is a tensile uh, um, strength element. So you're sewing straw from the cot that you're adding to a layer into the layer that you added before. You're building monolithically, meaning instead of making bricks and letting things dry, you have a gradation of moisture from the driest part that you started with to the fresh wet stuff you're adding and you're constantly connecting it so it comes out as one piece structurally it has no slip planes in it unlike adobe where you have bricks and mud mortar um, which it can be quite vulnerable to earthquakes um, and um, it is a rewettable material you do not stabilize it um, and i'm very clear on that because if you stabilize it and you walk away, well then you can't integrate your next layer in. Um, stabilizing means adding something like lime or petroleum that prevents water from um, allowing it to reactivate. So by keeping it alive and original, you can reactivate it and reuse it indefinitely, remodel indefinitely. It's all doable. Um, and it's, load, it's quite good at load bearing. It's very good at compression loads. So the, the aggregate component is what helps with that. So you can um, build a wall system that will hold quite a heavy roof. You can go up multiple stories. All of that's very doable with the material. Um, and as far as putting in windows and doors, it's a little bit like sticking it in the mud and mudding up around it. It's not very complicated. If you want to change a window or a door, it's re-wetting and reworking the material, pull out the wooden parts, plug the new material in, and you're good to go. So it's really, one of the other things that's really nice about this is that the, there are skills involved, but you can learn enough skill quickly. You can refine it for your lifetime. You can teach it easily, and anyone of any age can participate. On my uh, cob house in Sacramento, I have work that was done by a two and a half year old that's finished work, it's done. <laughs> so, um, and it, if you want free labor, kids love to dance in mud. So that's great, <laughs> great material for that. So I'm not sure what else to say about it now. I'm sure we'll have more questions about it as it comes up. Thank you. So hemp herd is the center of the hemp plant. And in order to use it as a building material, you actually need the traditional industrial hemp. So we're calling the CBD hemp industrial, and that's kind of a, a legal way of making it move forward. But the traditional plants grow like bamboo, and they grow to 14, 16 feet high. And that core is woody enough to be able to uh, have a structural load uh, component to it. They also have to be, um, it's called the shiv too, and it has to be cut uniformly. Because what happens is you mix it with water and lime and sometimes sand or cement, depending like the snow line, it's good to use a little bit of cement just to make sure that you're fortifying the foundational pieces of it. But that only has to be 18 inches high. So most of the building is not done with anything other than the hemp herd and the lime and the water. <clears throat> and you frame out your building as you want it to be. And then you do shuttering uh, is a simple way of doing it. And that's basically taking a plywood against the back. And you can, there's a machine, there's one called a canna blaster. And you can actually use plastic framing, put it all together with screws, and then you just blow it on. It's really very efficient, but fairly expensive. So it can also be mixed in a masonry mixer, or you can do it in 
in tubs. So um, it's very lightweight. It's one sixth the weight of cement, and it's what they call hygroscopic. So the building continues to breathe and it continues to sequester carbon from the environment. So growing the plant is a carbon capture, and your building is a carbon capture as well. So uh, hemp buildings are water resistant, fireproof, they're earthquake proof. It takes about 10 years to reach that status. They're also mold, mildew, and pest resistant or proof. Um, and that's because your building becomes a limestone monolith. That lime eats up all of the wood and all of the untreated, you can't use galvanized screws, you have to use the traditional screws, but over time, instead of having joints in that building, it is one stone monolith. So if you have an earthquake, the whole building is moving. It's not coming apart at the joints. Um, and the hygroscopic piece also is it regulates the moisture inside the building so it can hold on to moisture when you need it and it can release moisture and it's also antimicrobial so let's say you're sick the family's sick inside the house if you cough all this stuff out the walls breathe it in purify it and send it back to you it's an incredibly healthy environment to be in um, and fairly uh, inexpensive to put together. It has an R factor of 25 or higher, depending on how thick your walls are. So 12 inches is where that game begins, and you can go up to 18, which is what most straw bale ends up being. So 18 inches thick, you get an even higher R factor. And the buildings stay at about 60 degrees year round, so it makes heating and cooling much easier, and radiant floor heat pretty much takes takes care of the heating needs. Um, so I think I'll stop there, and I'm sure we'll have questions that are more specific later. OK, so Earthships, like I said, um, tires are the main feature of an Earthship. So ours, at least, kind of looks like if you imagine a rectangle where three of the sides are tires, those are our walls. And so, you know, a tire is pretty much two feet wide. And we have 10 courses of tires stacked as if the tires are laying down on themselves, stacked up on top of each other. They're also um, battered backwards just a couple inches as you go up um, in, the, in the layers to prevent or to stabilize them. And so behind the tires, we have four feet of earth, which supports a higher R value of the insulation that's behind that. So um, altogether, we have about a R40 for the walls. Behind the insulation is um, a plastic six mil vapor barrier to prevent any moisture from coming in. And so that's the basic wall system. And then Earthships, one of their main features is the south face. So the other wall that's not tires is south facing to allow all of the sun to come in and heat up that thermal mass that I was talking about, which is anything like sand, earth, rock, anything that gets warm when the sun touches it is thermal mass. So we have an adobe floor that Eric helped us pour, which is a huge thermal brick. It's like a giant adobe brick that gets warmed up by the sun during the day and releases that heat at night when it cools off in the winter. Um, and then we have, Earthships used to do a, a south-faced slope roof also, but now the model that they're doing, the roof faces north so that any of the snow melt can melt slowly into the cistern that's behind the home. Um, and another big feature of the Earthships is their water system and water treatment, which they just, there's, it's a brilliant system of reusing water multiple times and it gets used in the planter cells that's part of the greenhouse, which is inside the home and gets used again and again, flushing toilets out. I'm, I'm, I think we'll talk more about that later, but. Um, yeah, that's the basic idea of an Earthship. Uh, <clears throat> with uh, with straw bale construction, there's basically two 
uh, uh, schools of thought or, or um, ways of building. Uh, the one you'll see primarily is post and beam uh, with straw bale infill. And the load of the house is actually on the posts and the beams, kind of like the uh, uh, telephone poles here at the front of the stage. That would take the weight, and then you'd infill the walls with straw bales, staggering them like you would bricks, um, so that the joints uh, you know, you have your first course in the joint, there's a bale, you know, that is, that is um, uh, split between that joint, uh, which, which adds stability. Your other school of thought, uh, and maybe less traditional, um, is the load-bearing route. Uh, I believe it was about 20 years, maybe even more, that... Um, uh, the University of Arizona did a, uh, a weight and compression test on straw bales, and I don't remember the specific figures, but a, a single straw bale can... 72,000 PSI. 72,000 PSI. Thank you, Robin. Um, that's a lot of, of pressure. Uh, so PSI, uh, was that? Uh, pounds per square inch. Uh, that is an incredible amount of weight that you can put on a straw bale. Um, so that's why uh, I experimentally chose to go two stories high. Um, the building's still standing, by the way. Um, straw bale has been around for quite a while. I believe it started in um, Nebraska. And um, those buildings are still standing. The nice thing about straw bale is it's highly insulative. There's a lot of trapped air inside of a straw bale, um, so you don't get a lot of permeability. Where the bales meet, that's your that's your critical place to uh, do infill. Um, it's a great place to to you know do a little hybrid. You could do you could do cob. You could probably even do hempcrete. Um, the other thing is on the finish of straw bale. Um, some people choose to go the route of uh, Portland-based cement stucco on the outside of their building, figuring that it's, it's water impervious, um, which it is, but it's not, it's not vapor permeable. So any vapor, uh, especially in a dry climate like this, your, your highest source of vapor is breathing and cooking on the inside of a building. And that vapor is going to want to try to travel outwards, and when it hits, um, when it hits cold, it's going to condense. So uh, the idea of having a, a waterproof barrier on the outside, it's great from keeping that you know, exterior moisture from penetrating in, but it's not going to allow interior moisture to escape. Uh, so the other route that you can, you can choose to explore with straw bale is uh, a natural uh, plaster or, or at least non-Portland-based cement um, stucco finish. Uh, I'm a huge fan of, of um, Adobe. Uh, it doesn't quite stand up, uh, but as a, as a first coat, it, it works well. And then on top of that, you can do a, uh, um, a lime plaster, which is very traditional. Uh, it's been, you know, lime plasters have been used for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Roman cement was, they didn't have Portland uh, in Rome. Um, the other thing to consider with straw bale is compression. The bales will settle, and you want to help that along. Um, oftentimes, the the bales are skewered on all thread, and you'll have a um, kind of a bond beam on the top, usually made out of wood, with um, that acts uh, as as a plate that you can tighten down, and you can you can get that compression out of the straw bales. In addition to using um, uh, uh, strapping, like you see on on pallets when they come off of like a big truck, um, that helps with the compression as well. Because if you don't do that, you're going to end up you know, building this structure, plastering it, finishing it, and then as the years go by, that building will settle and everything will crack and uh, you'll have to redo it. Um, other than that, straw bale is very compatible with, um, you know, all the previously mentioned uh, building techniques, although I don't know exactly on, on, the, uh, on, on earth ships, but definitely with, with hempcrete and, and um, with cob. Thank you. So... My building system is um, structural insulated panels, and it's basically um, simple and fast, as well as extremely energy efficient. 
Um, with structural insulated panels, you can build any shape or size of a home that you would like. You basically use a traditional type of foundation. So your foundation can be a slab on grade or it could be a crawl space or a basement. And basically you, walls come in and you basically stand up the walls and the um, electrical conduit is in the walls and the, um, the walls are insulated and the walls are sheeted on the inside. And you stand up the walls, um, you basically use a um, common nail gun, you can do it by hand, but it would take forever, I would think, but use a common nail gun, you shoot about eight, eight inch on center um, in the joints of the house. And then you put a typical roof system on the house. So you could use a truss, truss roof, a TJI, um, you know, eye joist roof, or you could use actually a SIP roof. They make SIP roofs. And the SIP roofs are, uh, they're great. They're a little bit expensive, but they're great if you want uh, to cover large spans. So if you want like large open ceilings and large spans, they're great for that. And then the house on the exterior and interior is finished like a traditional home. Or in Swatch County, um, you know, industrial building materials are becoming more and more in vogue. And I know there's a lot of people, including me, that still have some OSB showing in their house. And um, the SIPs come with OSB, so you can really, you're supposed to sheet them with drywall to get a, get a quote, uh, UBC fire rating, but the OSB, the, the sheeting that's inside basically already comes uh, with that fire rating and standard. So you can basically stand up a home and have a roof on it um, with some friends or with some help from us in a few weeks and uh, move in and then do your framing and fight with your plumber and electrician to get a get a toilet and heat in there, like everyone else has to do. So we're all the same, we're all the same. Um, we might save more energy, we might not. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna actually defer and be very, very supportive of all the, the true alternative builders that are here. And uh, their systems, especially if you wanna build your own home and do something crafty and creative, th these are, this is, I've been to the homes these guys have done. It's absolutely worth visiting. They're really, really phenomenal builders. <laughs> or we're crazy, one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> ten, year, ten years later. <laughs> absolutely. Um, okay, and I'm going to uh, go ahead and just touch on Paper Creek because no one really mentioned Paper Creek, and I love Paper Creek. Um, Papercrete is one of those products that is a post-consumer product. So I currently have a product that I'm using in my hybrid earthship that is uh, manufactured down in Texas out of old uh, Texas phone books. So essentially, my whole upstairs is a bunch of Texas phone books, which makes me feel very good. I'm also building, like Goldie and Matt, an earthship. So I'm a junk collector. And I'm basically building a house out of all the junk that I find. Um, one man's trash is another treasure for sure. Um, Papercrete has a, um, a wonderful R value. It's about a 3.25 an inch. The product I'm using are Adobe sized bricks. So they're four by 10 by 14. Um, so that gives my wall about an R45 insulation value upstairs, which is relatively high. And the rest of my house is mostly um, thermal mass, which I think, let's talk about briefly thermal mass and the difference between thermal mass and R value. Thermal mass is something that will store heat for you. Water being your number one thermal mass, the number one storage medium of heat is water. So anytime you have the ability or you see people with their uh, greenhouses who have the 50-gallon drums painted black in the back of the greenhouse as thermal mass, they're capturing all of that excess heat, trying to stabilize the internal air temperature by storing the excess into the mass. As the internal air temperature drops, the mass stored in the, uh, or the heat stored in the mass will then release back into the air to stabilize the temperature in the building. 
Our value, on the other hand, is the ability for a room to hold temperature or for a wall's ability to keep uh, the temperature from leaking out. Where mass is trying to absorb it, our value inside of a wall like a straw bale is actually just holding the heat inside of the space. Does that make sense? Yes. Or did I just ramble? No, awesome. that was perfect. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so back to uh, papercrete. The last thing I'll say about papercrete is it's incredibly strong. It's got a uh, compression factor um, of about 3,000 PSI, which is stronger than concrete. So it's a post-consumer material, highly insulatory, um, and super strong. And, oh, wait. The question was using it. And basically any mason can use papercrete blocks. The one thing I will say, uh, the other thing I'll say about papercrete is if you look online, there's a lot of information about papercrete online, and you will find more horror stories about papercrete failures than papercrete's successes, unfortunately, because papercrete is really a very finicky product. And here's the easiest way I've come up with to uh, be able to explain it, and that is papercrete is made of post-consumer paper that you grind back up into fiber, and then you mix um, if you're not, you know, if you're okay with Portland, you can mix Portland, you can use lime. There's a few other additives that you can use, much like the hempcrete, to make a basis to hold the fibers together. Um, the challenge becomes, if you're making your own fiber to make papercrete, and your fiber blend is not consistent, you have inconsistencies from one brick to the next, or from one layer of finished material to the next. Those two layers may or may not like each other very well. So they may not bond as well as you want them to because technically they're two different things. Think about it this way. If you blend up a mix of all construction paper and you blend up a mix of all magazines, those two fibrous end results are going to be completely different products. They may not like each other. So that's why I went with a, uh, a company down in Texas who's actually manufacturing a stable product where you can make sure that your monolithic wall is all consistent from top to bottom. All right, next question. Um, I think this will be a quick one. Are there any specialized skills required to use the system or any special information that you'd want to share? And I know some of you have already done a little bit of this. That's why I think it'll be a little quick. Go ahead, Tony. I, I am uh, the only thing um, that's required really of building structural insulated panels is um, ordering your materials uh, early and on time because they go up really fast. Which, for those of us that are building airships, don't know anything about that. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. So that, that's the only thing. Yeah. So that basically, get all your materials. You will not believe how fast they go up. Okay. Must be nice. Right. right. Well, mine, I'm going about as long as you are mine. <laughs> uh, with straw bale, uh, I mean, it helps if if you have experience with earth and plasters in the finish. But as far as just putting the bales, stacking them up, one by one. Um, I would suggest a, a set of um, bale hooks, which are, you know, a tool that ranchers know about, but most builders don't. Uh, I think that's one of the best things about Earthships is, you know, before I started building one, I had zero building uh experience at all and there's just so much information out there youtube videos and the earthship website that can help anyone do it so you don't really need sure experience is nice and it's nice when you have a lot of friends that have experience but it's yeah i would not say it's required i would definitely encourage anyone to just go for it um, and I would say with hemp building, there is some subtle nuances that it's really helpful to have someone with experience in terms of mixing the batches. Because like what you were talking about, you want those layers to interface. And hemp is self-healing. So unlike some of the ones that we've been talking about, you can let a period of time go and it's still going to um, relate 
and you can also poke out a hole if you need to and refill it if you had to do some work in that regard. And the other thing is I've done these projects with groups of people and this is more like the divine feminine. So I always have to remind people that we are not ramming earth because the lime and the hemp in the right combination, if you pound that down too hard, you squeeze the lime to the outside and it will not cure properly. So you have to pat it like a baby's behind. You do it very, very gently and very sweetly. Um, and the other thing is that the mixes um, in a single day, like we would be working maybe over a weekend, and the temperature, the moisture in the air, the, the angle of the sun, all of those things dramatically affect the final product. So what you do is you make a ball and you toss that up in the air. And you're supposed to toss it three times, and on the third time is when it kind of, it doesn't crumble, but it'll crack a little bit. And then you know you've got the right consistency. So every single batch, you can't just take a recipe and say, okay, I'm putting this much water, this much lime, this much herd. You really have to tinker with it. And in that way, it's good to have someone who has some experience until you get that down. And it's basically the consistency of an oatmeal cookie. When you get there and you know what that's supposed to be like, you got it. <laughs> a lot of what I have to say about cob and natural plasters and that sort of thing is very similar. It's a very good idea to get with someone who's experienced so they can get a feel for it because natural materials vary tremendously from one location to another. Um, and the, the understanding of when you have it optimized comes from the feel of it, and that's um, experiential. Um, other than that, a lot of specialized skills, no. I think it's helpful to understand how to keep walls vertical. It's important when you're building with earth, so learning how to true your walls. Um, manage drying um, of your cob structure so that um, the integrity is good in the wall system. It's not drying, not, you're not making a brownie that's um, completely wet on the inside and um, crusty and cracking on the outside um, and that you're not allowing it to um, over dry or be rained upon or something in some way where you're going to take a step backwards when you're building. Um, so finding someone who's experienced to work with is, is um, really important, but that experience passes quickly if you're in person with it. Um, it's not that hard to learn. Um, and once you know it in your body, you know it, period. Awesome. Thank you, all of you. Um, Let's let's move on to the actual costs, money outlay. Um, let's talk about a dried-in structure and what that means. We have foundation, your wall system, the roof is on and waterproof, and your windows and doors are in. You're ready to start exterior and interior finishing. Um, give, give the audience a, a relative... You know, not not necessarily perfectly accurate, but give them a good good idea of what it's going to cost to have a dried-in structure. Are we dealing with labor component, or how are we? Um, yeah, let's talk about money and labor, maybe. Yeah, money let's. Hours. Um, let's talk about it in terms of uh, materials for now, and because some, as you've said, your your building goes up really fast, Tony, so your labor component isn't as high. Um, so let's just stick with materials for now, and then we can go back and talk a little more about the, the immense energy that goes into, say, pounding tires and stacking straw bales and that sort of stuff. Does that work? Yeah, perfect. Cool. Yeah, go for it. John. I'll go ahead and start since I've got the mic. Um, Cob it can be pretty close to free if you're sourcing your own material. Um, you're using salvaged windows and doors, um, and that's what we're um, like a recycled uh, tin roofing, for example. If you're really um, thrifty, clever, and uh, avid about finding your materials, it can be close to free. Um, uh, I knew some people that you know, used to run a thousand dollar house workshop where you basically get a dried in house constructed for a thousand dollars in materials. Um, it's not big. 
but it's done. Um, so yeah, there you go. Um, and it can actually wind up going all the way up to conventional house pricing, depending on how you're doing it. Um, most of what I work with is I'm um, interested in people who are building their own homes. They want their hands in the material. They want to be completely involved with it. So they're the source of labor. And also, I'm very interested in the use of, of on-site materials, not just local, but actual on-site under your feet. Um, for my backyard in Sacramento, I can point and say, well, there's the hole in the ground, and here's the house. And my rich beam was that tree right there, part of it. And those pieces of wood were over there, and the, the recycled fencing was salvaged from up the street there and that I used for glued together to make rafters, and etc. cetera. Um, so it's very widely variable um, and hard to say, but the potential there is for the cost to be extremely low. Um, and um, yeah. I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. So again, I echo that. It depends on what you're trying to build and how fancy you want that to be. So I was involved as a volunteer in the first permitted owner-occupied home, a uh, hemp home in Colorado. That's a 1,500-square-foot house, and it's in a burn area up Risk Canyon behind Fort Collins. And so we felled all the trees and rolled them down the hill and stripped them and had them checked for, fi you know, for the, I've forgotten what the word is for it, but the density of the wood was purified by the fire itself, so they were all certified to be used. And that building is absolutely stunning and gorgeous on the inside, all beetle kill uh, on the um, uh, wall coverings that had coverings. Um, and the whole thing was about forty-five to fifty thousand dollars for that building, and that's with a lot of amenities. So fifteen hundred, wow. and um, and it's very posh. You know, it's really a nice place. We also built a twenty-foot in diameter uh, geodesic hemp dome, and that was a non-permanent building. So we built a. a Flat, uh, for foundation like this that we built it on and it was actually taking the place of a yurt that had blown away and uh, that cost a total for everything that was under ten thousand dollars and we did buy some materials like all the windows were new and there are things that you could repurpose to bring that down even more. Um, and that's used as a sacred space, a meditation uh, and classroom space. So it doesn't have electrical, it doesn't have plumbing, it's just a shell of a building. So all of those things would be up costs in that regard. Um, and then the other one that we did was a tiny house and that was framed out and and um, there's a man named Steve Allen who came from uh, Ireland, and he travels all over the world teaching people how to build hemp structures. And that one was, I think, maybe six or eight thousand dollars in materials. And again, labor. We did it as a workshop, so we were making money off of the students to pay for the materials that it costs to build that space. Um, and we did. Most of the work, we were able to experience all the different um, phases because um, with, when you're building with hemp, you can put in the floor, you can put in the walls, you can put the insulation, you can build the roof all out of hemp. But it's different mixtures that make that happen. Um, so uh, that, uh, again, the size of the building would make a big difference in how much material you're actually going to take. We did nine tons of hemp herd that we shipped from uh, Canada to do the first house. We had 11 tons, but we only used nine to build a 1,500-square-foot house. And they say if you're building your own, it takes about two and a half hectares, which is a, a different kind of measurement, but it's about three acres of land to build a 1,500-square-foot house if you were growing your own hemp to build it. So if you had a five-acre land, you could build your house from the land. 
So our house cost $38 per square foot to dry in. I keep really good notes on what we've spent. <laughs> and I did the math. I did not include the cost of putting in a well or septic because earth ships don't need those. So um, also keep in mind that we have done the huge majority of our own labor. We've not paid for a lot of labor. We also, I spent like a whole summer up in Denver checking Denver Craigslist free page, getting windows for our windows. So we've kept a lot of the material costs down. We've also gone on the more expensive side of some things, like for example, our roof is a metal roof, which is kind of a more pricey thing, but in the long term will probably pay off. We went with a little beefier um, TJ eyes so we could fit more insulation in our ceiling. We spent a little more on getting our roof spray foamed. So we spent a little more money where we thought it was worth it and then we tried to really just recycle materials. Like for example, one of our ceilings we did with um, vinyl flooring that was being thrown away from job sites up in Denver and we've used glass bottles that we got from the recycling center and the tires are free. Practically everyone in the world wanted to give us their tires <laughs> when they heard we were doing this. And what else? Yeah, we, the Adobe we used is pretty, pretty cheap and local and yeah. Um, to echo what others have said, I, it, it comes down to uh, design and size. I would dare say that a, um, uh, a simple square rectangular shaped building with a shed roof would be less expensive than getting fancy with it with you know round or, or any other way um, I am not a meticulous note taker so I can't I can't give you figures on what it cost me to, to get to dry in and it's been years since since I um, built a straw bale house um, but I will say yes there there's a labor intensity uh, um, labor intensive aspect to building with a straw bale. If you can just imagine the bales out here and picking those up and, and building a wall eight foot, by the time you get up there, obviously you're gonna be on scaffolding or something, but it, it takes so much energy to get that from ground level up. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't have specific figures though to give you. So, oh, wow, okay, so here once again, um, you can build SIP homes. Um, you can build SIP homes by yourself, and they can still have a warranty. And we come in and do some owner assist if you'd like to do that. Um, the cost of a, a SIP kit with um, the roof system, all the internal framing, uh, the external walls. So I'm adding in the internal framing. Um, the external walls, a relatively nice window package, and a uh, metal roof system is going to come in probably in, in, in oh, by the way, a um, two building code with footer uh, slab on grade foundation. All right. Um, it's probably going to come in around $60, 50, 50 to $60. A square foot. The kit for the SIP alone is about $35 per square foot, and then you add in your 30, 35, and then you add in your, um, you know, you add in your foundation and you add in your uh, roof system and windows and doors. Now the um, the interesting thing is is to put that thousand square foot house up with a experienced screwed uh, experienced crew. Um, you're dealing with maybe 200 labor hours. So if you're paying someone for that and you're you're paying an experienced crew that's a builder, I mean, that's going to add um, cost, but I'll sort of take that out. It's faster, um, but uh, speed comes with price, too. Yeah, oh, thank you. Um, just for uh, reference... Generally, you go into the city, you buy a home, you're looking at spending uh, 150 to 200 per square foot 
or more. The prices are going up Denver's, as Denver's as Tony's quarter average. Okay, so three hundred and twenty-five bucks a square foot average compared easy. to the kind of prices we're talking about here, and that's for dry-in. Obviously, building your own place, you save a lot of money. So, on to the next one. Of course you can, Robin. Of course you can, Robin. Would you like a mic to weigh in? Well, I'm kind of loud. <laughs> not loud enough to get you on the web. Well, I'll try with, uh, as I tell people, I'm an extra. I'm a shy person trapped in an extrovert's body, so I'm loud, but I. It's hard. Um, we. I. Uh, uh, I have a passion. I'm a survivalist from way back. Water, food, and shelter. They are basic human rights. So I have a passion for teaching and sharing people how to build their own home. And I love, uh, uh, hey babe, we gotta talk. Uh, <laughs> we're on a mind melt. Um, so I built my first home here in Crestone with absolutely no knowledge but some awesome fun neighbors uh, back in 1995. It's a 25-foot circle straw bale load-bearing two-story hogan with a sod roof for $6,000, wow. including electric and wood stove. Everything finished out. You can do this. I built my second straw bale home on the Earthnack property for $10,000. People said, do you have running water? I said, only if I run uphill from the creek with the bucket. <laughs> the POA didn't like that answer. We built a little rectangular, 28 by 15. We did all the work, we skidded the wood, my children grew up building. They are sculptures, they are heritage, they are legacy, and every moment you spend in them is one that fulfills you from the beginning of designing and creating to doing it to living in it. There's never a moment you aren't deeply and fully connected with the process. In both of these homes, that home has thermostated heat, water, electricity, and it costs 10,000 bucks. It's finished. Unless the materials were sourced like windows or doors from recycled places, everything in these homes came from within a hundred mile radius of this place. The third home we built for our godfather, Ami Kohn, many of you know, was a beautiful round two-story post and beam structure, not low bearing this time. Uh, $42,000, two kitchens, bathroom and a half, two floors, 1,100 square feet. And when you walk in, if you haven't been there before, most people start to cry. It is a work of art, and it has such a beautiful energy. You can do this. You can build an incredible home from local materials for very little money. So I wanted to share that because I heard some higher prices. And for me, my husband and I and my kids, we came here with 500 bucks in our pocket in 1994. That's all we had. And we have been able to thrive, not just survive. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, Robin. So I'll just uh, talk about papercrete for a quick second. Um, those papercrete blocks, uh, 10 by 14 by 4, these days are running, I believe, about 350 a brick. So based on what size you want to build, you can kind of do the math yourself. Uh, it is probably about as cost effective as most traditional building systems, with the exception of you're getting a monolithic wall structure with uh, built-in insulation. You don't have to uh, net it, stucco sit, stick straight to it, uh, plaster stick straight to it. Okay, what's next? Oh, let's see. Lifespan. How about... Yeah, I think that's a good one, Eric. Or that one or that one. 
Hey, we're going to do them both yeah, anyway. It don't yeah. matter. <laughs> uh, let's, yeah, yeah, let's go. <laughs> we'll go with lifespan. <laughs> So let's talk about lifespan of structures, um, things like that. How long do you expect once you build one of these? A lot of people, especially stick frames, are looking at 50-year roofs, thinking that's going to be um, significant, which for a stick frame home is definitely significant. Um, but I'm an earthship freak, and a 50-year roof isn't anywhere near going to cover the structure that us earth shippers are building. So um, there's some other things to take into consideration. So what type of lifespans do you guys expect out of the, uh, these types of homes? Uh, the homes that we build with stru EPS structural insulated panels come with a, um, a warranty and um, I think that you can talk about your traditional building lifespan and or longer and I will say that the only homes that survived uh, some of the early on California, not this year, but California, I don't know about this year, but California and Arizona fires were SIP homes basically because they're so tight and sealed so well. So they, they actually, um, the lifespan and performance of them is, uh, is generally, I would say, long. <laughs> long works. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, there are homes, straw bale homes that are over 100 years old that are still standing in Nebraska. Uh, I, would, I would warrant uh, 100 years or more, um, depending on watershed, uh, foundation, and um, you know your exterior finish. But uh, yeah, I think if you did everything right, 100 years or more, it could be it could be a, a, a heritage home that you you know pass down along in the family. And I'm just going to talk about that for just a second. Jeff, because I think there's a lot of us that are focused on that, realizing that um, debt is not our friend. And that's why a lot of us are building our own homes out of pocket, out of recycled materials. There's an economic long term where um, being able to set the future generations up for no debt load on their living space is inspiring to us. To think about my nieces and nephews and cousins, that they will potentially have a place to go that does not cost them to be. It actually is going to give them resources by being there. Um, it's just an inspiring way to look at the future versus the potential debt load that we're about to put the future generations under, which I think is going to be a little astronomical and unbearable. Thanks, Jeff. Of course. Um, I enjoy uh, dissecting words. I guess it's entomology, but mortgage, mort, gauge, mort means it. You know, it it, it derives from uh, death, mortuary, and gauge is pledge. So uh, a mortgage is a death pledge. Just want to throw that out there. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> So yeah, Earthships are definitely going to outlive all of us and probably our kids and the tire structures alone, you know, it's, it's, it's when they're buried in all that earth, they're very fireproof and Mike Reynolds and the Earthship Biotexture crew actually, they go into a lot of places that have experienced natural disaster and they, they build these homes there because they're, they're really resistant to tsunamis and earthquakes and fire and all these things. So they're, yeah, they're really built to last. The Anasazi are going to be jealous. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, hempcrete is kind of new back on the scenes, um, but there is a 5th century bridge in France that's still standing. And water likes to erode things, so that's a pretty good testimony. And what they're saying is that a home um, should last 300 years. Um, is what they're estimating, and that's because it becomes a limestone monolith. And so, and again, like what we were talking about earlier, the building doesn't have drywall. It doesn't have all these other components that break down. It's just simply that building that's sustaining itself. So, um, good long time, you could definitely pass it down. All right, uh, I'll tell a quick story. Um, one of my main mentors, uh, Ianto Evans of Cobb Cottage Company, um, is a Welshman, grew up um, there, and uh, when he was in high school, he dated a woman who 
Kobbs, whose family had lived in the same Cobb house generation after generation for 900 years. Um, there are a lot of very old Cobb buildings uh, in the British Isles and in some other places in, in, um, in the world. So um, insects won't eat it, it won't burn, it won't rot. Um, if you pound it with rain on its vertical wall surface, it erodes at a rate of about one inch per hundred years. So if you had foot thick walls, think about it, it'll last quite a while even if you do absolutely nothing and your children do absolutely nothing and your grandchildren, as long as the roof's on, as long as the roof's intact, right? Um, and so it's a potentially indefinite lifespan actually for, um, for the wall system at least. Um, and I can tell more stories or examples of that, but I don't want to take up any more time. If you're interested, ask me. Sean? Yes. The, uh, Sorry, Sean. All right, go ahead. Um, Taos Pueblo? Taos Pueblo comes to mind. Yeah. Do you know any stats on that? Um, I don't. Is it monolithic or is it more like an adobe where it's bricked and... It's all a, yeah, it's all adobe, but I believe it's one of the longest inhabited structures. Anyone? Um, I think it's six. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good point, Robin. Um Cobb has no toxic legacy. If you wet the walls from the top, it does, it'll fall apart relatively quickly um, and become garden soil. Plants will grow out of it. There's nothing there that's going to bother any organism. It's going to create any kind of problem, really. Um, and it's infinite, indefinitely reusable, um, both uh, in Japan and the traditional earthen buildings there. They'll um, very um, carefully reuse um, material that's been in a building for 150 years and then who many, how knows how many times it's been reused. You just get it wet, dance on it, add a little bit of fresh straw for new tensile strength and put it back together again and good for another 150 years. Thank you very much. Um, so it's, um, it, it, it could have an indefinable, not only lifespan, but rebirth span is potentially indefinite. Brilliant, thanks. That's true of him also. And Suzanne just said the same thing about hemp, that it has the same qualities. Well, all right. So after we've got a house built, you've been living in it five years, you want to throw a guest bedroom on it. Tell the, uh, tell the folks here, how hard is it to retrofit or put an addition on to your various different styles of building? Again, go back and um, I'd rate it as somewhat challenging, um, but definitely doable. Um, a lot of cases um, in workshops and situations where I'm advising people, I say, uh, plan for it. Um, put in a, an arched doorway in your wall mass and then fill that in with something that's easy to remove because going through Cobb, I've done it um, in my own house. Um, I found out how strong my house was when I had to pickaxe my way into the wall very laboriously to change some, th some aspect of it. I, I subsequently found that a hammer drill is actually with a chisel bit is pretty good if you want to add electrical back or whatever, but that's a, you know, it's a tiny amount removed at a time. It can be quite arduous. The other thing that's an issue is um, getting a, a, a wall to attach to an older dry wall is somewhat tricky. You have to basically hollow into the wall a little bit to create almost like a, um, a dovetail joint for those who are familiar with that sort of thing, and then pack, you know, wet that down really well to activate the clay that's in there, pack your new cob in there, or stick a stick a uh, stick in with nails in it so that you have basically a, um, a member that the old cob that, that allows grip. Otherwise, they'll pull apart because cl cob will shrink away from a, an older surface that you try to attach to. It's tricky, but it's doable. And as far as replacing windows and that sort of thing, that's actually relatively easy as long as your cob is re re reworkable by rewetting. You want to keep it that way. Um, so that's what I'll say about it. So I haven't actually had that experience, so I'm speaking just from what I've learned about hemp, and it's called self-healing. So very much like uh, working with the cob or pottery, you have to have like a slip that's going to bond those two uh, structures together. And that can be easily done provided you use similar materials, 
as you did the first time. So there's a specific kind of um, lime that is only found in France, and they really recommend that because it has the elasticity that you need. And so, again, you would have to replicate the materials as closely as possible in order to have that bond and that seal work. And then you also have to create, and you can do this, I, I failed to mention the other half of the, um, when you're doing shuttering, how we did it was uh, we put PVC pipe in between, so we put in a bolt so that we could make sure that the walls stayed consistently 12 inches uh, wide. And the same kind of thing, when you pull that PVC pipe out, you fill in, you plug those areas. So when you're gonna do some kind of attachment, you would have to do that same type of thing, drilling out holes and then plugging them with the new materials so that you have a stronger structural bond. I think additions on Earthships would be a little bit difficult also unless you planned for it. And in our case, we kind of did the what they call the wing walls of the Earthship or the parts that come out and kind of hold the berm back. And so we have the option to continue that tire wall and do another U if we wanted to. So just plan for it. Uh, with straw bale, I think if you went uh, post and beam and, and plan for it, it'd be much easier than if you went load bearing. Um, you could just add, you know, more framing and then just do more infill with uh, with the straw. Uh, load bearing would be a little tricky if if you were cutting into it. Um, it'd have to be almost like a uh, a cold joint because if the bricks, you know, it'd be hard to key in uh, additional straw bales to uh, to extend a wall. Fast and easy, but um, in listening, just because a lot of what I do, it's uh, the business called artisanal buildings, and it's like everything for me is sort of an art study and experiment. And I love what I love what they do, and we start talking about additions, and I would love to, you know, try a hempcrete as like an addition or a root cellar or like a separate room and the same thing with the cob I don't know the I don't know the straw bales I just think are great I've been watching a bunch go up and I think that they're really really super um, and I've seen that earthship since in, Goldie's earthship since inception and what they've done there is just beauty so um, again we're we are fast and easy we are absolutely more money than getting into the dirt, than building on your own, own building on your own with alternative methods. Um, but we enable you to live surreptitiously through these people in Crestone. <laughs> and um, right, and if you wanted to do this on your own and wanted to learn how to do it, we'd sell you, we'd, we'd get you a SIP kit and all the plans and everything. Um, and, and help you do that too, just like they do. Nice. Excellent. The, and uh, as far as papercrete goes, uh, papercrete is pretty easy to cut back apart once it's in. So um, if you wanted to extend a portion of your house out in a direction because, I don't know, your dad retired and moved in with you, um, <laughs> <laughs> you could pretty easily well, drill a hole the through the wall. <laughs> And just start cut that section out and extend on, and it should be just fine. Uh, same issues as the others. You just have to figure out how to way, a way to key those two, um, those two new the new structure to the old structure, so that you have some stability in there. Okay. Uh, next one. How about any uh, home maintenance? When you're actually talking about the, uh, as anyone who owns a home knows, it's a never ending list of things to do. And so as these homes are completed and you start living in them for a while, what maintenance issues um, do you have? And is that something that as a home owner you can handle? Or are those things that you'll need a contractor to come in for? So the maintenance um, on the homes that we build would be, um, similar to traditional homes and maybe in some ways similar to some of the building uh, techniques that they're all using because I think the first thing we think about maintenance is 
maybe the leaky roof, and we use metal roofs or different types of roof structures that are maybe similar. And um, you know, if the roof's done right, I mean, I think you're looking at maybe 15, 10, 15 years. Maybe you need to get up there every few years having a roofing contractor on a metal roof, look at how the screws are in. Um, our homes are stuccoed, and or we use uh, like a, a uh, wood product or composite type of board on the outside, and they do some of the similar types of things with the finishing of their house. Um, the core of the house isn't, um, unfortunately, it's not recycling into the earth, and unfortunately, it's, um, you know, it, it is what it is, but I think the core of our home and the walls of our home are going to require very little, if any, maintenance. It's pretty, we're pretty fast and easy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with straw bale, um, I immediately go to exterior finish. Um, again, um, Portland basement stucco. Um, yeah, you might have to redo that if it cracks. The beauty of lime plaster, and I, I'm, I'm imagining these two will agree with me, is that it um, it may crack, but uh, uh, rainwater. Uh, will dissolve the lime and uh, it'll reseal. Um, sometimes you might get out there with a lime wash and and, and wash it down, which is a very um, uh, traditional thing in England where they where they did a lot of lime plaster. Um, you know, you go out there and you just lime wash the house and it seals up the cracks. Um, otherwise, maintenance. Um, again, making sure your 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 uh, roof and your watershed is good, so the bales aren't getting wet. Um, and as you build it, you know, thinking about maintenance, uh, thinking about the next guy down the line, yourself or or whoever, um, and you know, doing uh, uh, rodent proofing um, and and other things you can do ahead of time to save you headaches later later on down the road. So earth chips are basically like buried on three sides on the outside. So if you have a solid roof, then there shouldn't be a lot of maintenance on the exterior. Otherwise, we do have a cement plaster on the exterior of the south face of our home. So that that might need maintenance. Um, but the cool thing about building your own home is that we we like we know our home really well. So I think as far as maintaining it, there's no one more capable of doing that than the people that are living in it and have built it. So that feels really good. And then also, um, the beauty of an earthship is that it is this symbiotic relationship between who's living in it and the home because the home is providing a lot of basic needs for who's living in there as far as food and water and shelter and heat and energy and even beauty. Um, and so as the homeowner, there's this responsibility to be more aware of the environment that you're in and you know like being aware of when when the sun's out and how much energy you can use on your solar system that day or how full your cistern is and how like often you're flushing your toilet it's kind of just like this very interactive dance that happens in the home and i just i think that's a a positive aspect of it is you really have a responsibility to like live and and care for your home as it cares for you um, the dome that we built, I learned a very significant lesson. Um, we did not tarp very well. And if I were to do that again, I would actually build a structure that was going to shelter the building. We used a lime plaster and stucco that the recipe actually came from Rome. It was very fun to work with it, but I did have cracking on the outside, and that was fairly significant. Other people who do stucco told me that's pretty normal for three years. You've got to keep working with it um, to deal with some of those cracks, but that was definitely a maintenance piece. As far as the inside, all of the electrical, all the wiring and 
plumbing and all that really has to be in sleeves of PVC pipe so that if you do have to get in there, you know exactly where it is and how to access it. That would be the only other nuance on that. Um, just like building with Cobb, um, you are, if you're the builder, you have access to repairing it fairly easily. Um, and that includes not necessarily even going somewhere to get your materials other than where you got them in the first place in your, on your land or very nearby, um, which is a benefit of that. Um, like a conventional building, finishes degrade over time. Um, somewhat unlike a conventional building, um, a lot of cob construction involves um, curved surfaces, highly variable surfaces, uneven surfaces. Um, and what happens when one of those such a thing ages is that um, the exceptions to your intention um, become a field of relationships, kind of like um, artwork. And so they don't bother you. It's quite different than having a flat wall that's 10 feet wide and 8 feet tall, and there's one little chip out of one corner. Oh, i got to change that chip. It bugs me. That doesn't quite happen. It's more like, oh, there's some wear and tear there, and that color's uneven or whatever. And look at the light moving across it, and the light's kind of doing this. Oh, that's very nice. I'm tr sipping my tea and I'm enjoying this. So, um, so there's a difference in how... The, the actual experience of needs maintenance. What does needs maintenance mean? It might not actually need maintenance. You might be enjoying its aging process. Um, and in some cases, um, you have an opportunity for renewal, which, you know, painting your house is kind of like that. Hey, I'm going to put in a new color. I'm going to do something different. Um, earth and plasters are really fun to play with. No power tools needed, you know. You get to play with mucky stuff and put it up on the walls, it looks good. You know, you get an opportunity for renewal. So you can think of um, maintenance instead of a burden as an opportunity potentially when you're using materials that you really enjoy using and having on your hands and dealing with. So, and you can make natural paints as well if you were in interested in paint surfaces, painting surfaces rather than plastering them. Um, there's a variety of natural paints you can make um, that are non-toxic and very low cost and um, easy to work with. Ah, here's Robin, Robin again. Hey, of course, Robin. <laughs> Robin's our guest panelist for the day. Hi. <laughs> so, um, exterior plasters and trying to be a purist before I sort of gave it up. Um, and we had, as many of you out in the Baca or the Chalets know, lots and lots of prickly pear cactus. And so um, I've been a primitive skills teacher for many years. We did a lot of pottery. And I had used prickly pear cactuses when I made my natural pigments in paints or pottery. I'd use prickly pear cactus juice as a fixative for my paints. And if you'd mix the prickly pear juice with the paint or the, the pot, it would actually be waterproof. So I thought, hey, there's a whole lot of cactus on this property. So my husband and I got two 55-gallon barrels, and we set them on the fire, and we boiled a lot of prickly pear cactus for two weeks. It was really very fun. And we strained it all off, and we mixed it in our top coat of adobe for a 10 and a half foot high uh, adobe wall exterior, and um, plastered it that way. And it worked. It worked beautifully. Um, I the other house I told you for ten thousand. I didn't get to the adobe plaster, and we had one of our classic uh, July monsoon rains, or they used to be July monsoon rains. Um, and the coolest thing happened. I had spent actually a lot of time like using the trowel, and the rain came and it hit hard, and I had this amazingly gorgeous pebbled wall, so I grabbed the prickly pear and I coated that over. Um, when I was in high school, I read a book called The Good Earth by Pearl S. Buck, and she talked about the peasant families breaking the eggs and using the egg white and rubbing them uh, and getting heat from their hand into the dirt floors, and that would last for three or four years, and then they'd just do it again. So I was like, Hey, that sounds cool. I had this part of my Hogan that came out, so I did egg whites, because we raised chickens. And it worked for two years. I had a, a beautiful water seal on a sloped, lower exterior of my building. So do something weird and creative. Try it. It might work. 
<laughs> right? Yep, that's great. Um, like, uh, if you're making earthen plasters, you can get all the stinky stuff out of your fridge, the scary things from the back of your fridge that you want to leave there because you don't want to deal with them. We'll take them out and put them in a, um, some kind of bucket or something as part of your plaster mix, and it helps make them stronger and more water resistant. So it's valuable. That's that valuable. nasty stuff is valuable. Yeah, don't <laughs> get creative. <laughs> Talk about zero waste. Yeah, right, that's where right. we're getting to it. So out out here in the desert, I mean, I think building out here in general is pretty easy. You know, it's dry, got really consistent weather. There are other places, there are other climates, there are other folks living in different conditions. Um, what? adaptations or changes to your building style would make it more or less workable in other kinds of climates? Well, Cobb is mostly thermal mass, um, and thermal mass is not your friend if you let it get really cold, um, because your body actually reads radiant heat before it reads air temperature heat. So as I'm sitting here, I'm getting a fair amount of sun. I know that the air temperature isn't that high today. It's actually kind of modest or whatever, but I feel like, wow, this is this is summery for me right now because I'm getting radiant heat right on my body. Um, and so the opposite of that is having radiant cooth, if you would, if there's such a word. In other words, your walls get cold and you try and heat up the air to feel okay and you don't because your body's f feeling the radiant temperature of your walls and it's like, no, this is not habitat. I don't want to be here. So what you want to do with Cobb, if you're in a colder place, is you want to outsulate because your insulation goes on the outside of your thermal mass. You want to outsulate your wall on the north side um, and maybe the east and west side and have a pure Cobb wall mass only where it's facing the sun. Um, so that's one adaptation. Another is to hybridize it completely and actually have co um, a Cobb straw bale hybrid where you have Cobb interior wall mass and then you have straw bale. Um, they mate very well even in very wet climates. They've been tested in Oregon where they get up to 300 inches of rain in the winter uh, and that's not a problem. Um, so, so using an insulating material on the outside of your thermal mass is a really good idea of taking any um, cob or any other high mass material and making it more useful in cold places. Um, and water is not your friend when you're, you know, if it's a high humidity area with hemp building. Um, and that's where the ratio of the lime comes in and you actually mix more sand in order to compensate for that. Um, more silicate in the, in the structure. Um, and then the Portland cement can also be helpful in that regard. Something to know though is you cannot do a foundation out of hemp because Mother Earth wants to reclaim everything and in 10 years she'll eat your floor, you know, before it becomes the, the limestone. Um, so I think those would be the main considerations. And then, like I mentioned before, making sure that you are covering your structure. Just like when you're working with pottery, you don't want that clay to dry too quickly. And that's a real consideration with our wind and our sun here. That, that's something that you have to be tarping every section that you're doing in order to really be successful in the bonding of it. So earth ships have been built all over the world and they're actually, they have this model called the global model because of that. They're really, they've figured out a way where, you know, if you're in the Northern hemisphere, you face them towards the South, you insulate all of that thermal mass and they really function really well all over. Um, I actually, I did the Earthship Academy down in Patagonia and we built this earth ship that is super insulated and I'm still in touch with the people that live down there and it functions really well even when they're only getting four hours of sunlight a day. Um, there is, they've adapted the design for if you're going to be building it around the equator where you don't necessarily need as much solar um, gain. Where in, in those cases they build them and they call it the flower. So it's like a circle with kind of petals of rooms that go off the sides and that's just because you kind of want to keep, to keep it cool, they keep the sun from coming into the home. Um, so yeah. Uh, with straw bale, it's, it's paramount that you do uh, keep it dry and draped. Um, 
uh, especially in, in a uh, more moist climate. If I were to do it again, I, I've toyed around with the idea of taking each bale and, and dunking it in, in like a lime slip uh, before I would stack it just to um, – uh, f- the lime would it acts as a um, uh, a fire retardant and also as a. Um, Can I share something on that? Yes, yeah, sweet, here May already has something to f- to share. Yeah. Um, Let me yeah, here, take the mic. Yeah, that that exact technique right there. Um, my dad made something called scrub, or at least that's what we called it, and. Uh, Probably the cheapest way you can insulate a standard framed wall with a clay mixture. And essentially any long straw like that, you could take any of these straw bales and you mix it in a decently thick but still runny clay straw, clay lime mixture. Um, and then on the inside of your walls, you're going to take rusty nails, screws, whatever it is. Like as long as you have something to attach to, you run it up the inside of your frames and you run baling twine back and forth. And you can get baling twine from any farmer <laughs> that runs a farm. You will get plenty free baling twine. Um, and then you can just drape that straw mixture across the baling twine and stack it up the walls and insulate walls for like 50 cents a square foot or something less than that. You know, if you're not paying for your materials, it's free. Um, and so that's exactly what you were saying. I was like, oh, my God, that's that's three of the walls on our house are all insulated with straw, as we call it. So. Passing the secret on. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Mayori. Yeah. Thanks, Mayori. And I've seen that house in the Straub, and it is spectacular, what Mayori's, Mayori's uh, family and father built. Um, so um, structural insulated panels are used for – are used in Antarctica. They're used at the equator. And they're used on the highest mountains. They're used for weather systems because they're um, they're easy from a standpoint to for the engineers. They know enough about them now. They can engineer them. You can build the walls with um, basically talking about snow load, wind load, and thermal and structural insulated panels um, can be built to. I have one right now that that I'm building that's in fair play that's rated at 165 mile an hour wind and has 11,000 pound down and uplift loads on the corners. Right. So, yeah. It's just a, the thing's like a sail going into the wind. So the point is is that it's a different product. It can be um, engineered for any type and it's designed to be engineered for any type of an environment. And... Um, that's it. And easy. Fast and easy. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see. The, the paper crete is just uh, similar to the straw bales, um, super insulatory. So your passive solar design is actually what's going to shift with that versus uh, what you might actually do with the product. It'll perform just as well in a, a moist, humid climate as it does up here in the high altitude desert. Again, it's just a matter of whether you're trying to bring heat in to hold or whether you're trying to keep it out. All right, we are rounding the bend, y'all. So this is the last one. The big question, here it comes. Um, Permitting and code issues with the system. Like, can you, if I lived in Aurora, can I build with what you guys are doing? Well, how's that work out? So, um, structural insulated panels, um, as well as straw bale, and I'm not sure about the other methods, but SIPs have their own section in the ICC code book, as do straw bales, and then there's local regulations um, that uh, might surpass it. But I'll, I'll say this, so Breckenridge and Aspen, which are probably the antithesis of Crestone, um, but Breckenridge and Aspen have, yes, have, yes, um, have basically adapted um, building cones that are extremely green and basically extremely energy efficient. And um, in those communities where cost isn't necessarily an object, okay, 
um, a lot of the builders are converting over to SIPs and SIP structures and using them because we're um, you're dealing with a, a wall that has in, that has integrated insulation versus um, insulation that would cost for a stick frame house that actually costs more than the entire SIP wall structure. So um, SIPs are great for, SIPs are fast and easy for code. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it just keeps working, doesn't it, Tony? Uh, if, you want, if you want to go the slower route, uh, uh, <laughs> Straw bale, I know there's a few in El Paso County where I used to live. Um, there's tons here. Uh, otherwise, yeah, it, it's gaining more um, in acceptability. Yeah, so. So I actually started out wanting to build an earthship in Jefferson County, which is outside of Denver. And besides the fact that no one even knew what I was trying to like show them what I wanted to build. No one knew what an earthship was. Finally, the answer that I got was that it wasn't allowed because it was made out of recycled materials. So that just proves to me, I like to always say that building codes are making dollars and not cents because <laughs> like really, like it's 2020 and we're, we're not allowed to build things out of recycled materials. That is just stupid. So, um, yeah, earthships are not. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, they're not widely accepted, and the one of the reasons that I ended up in Crestone was because it is considered a pocket of freedom um, where there's no building codes. And yeah, I think that they're you know they've been now they're statewide permitted in New Mexico, which I think means you know there's a lot of possibility for that happening all over, but it's it's a slow process. So yeah. And again, with hemp, because it's a new industry that's pushing out those boundaries. And um, we had a man, and I'm having trouble remembering his name, who actually had the first permitted cob, first straw bale, first hemp. I mean, that was his thing, was to push this agenda forward. So without him, I think it would have been really a challenge for us. But with his clout and his ability to... Um, uh, champion these alternative forms of building. Um, that was relatively easy. And Fort Collins is really progressive in that regard. And I know Denver now does allow some hemp uh, building and it's all over the country. So I think all of those rules and regulations will continue to soften as it proves itself. And I think it definitely will prove itself as a really wonderful building material. So I think it's on the horizon. Cobb is largely unknown in the code. Um, and the uh, circumstances I know where people have built um, Cobb buildings where they got it permitted, they basically built a post and beam to have the um, the roof held up by post and beam. And then they called the Cobb something else, like monolithic adobe or mineral infill or something, so that it sounded like something that was fairly common and not likely to burn. And so they were able to get a stamp on their building. So there's a lot of work to do, uh, potentially, in getting Cobb into the code. I have mixed feelings about it. Um, there's a um, One of the things that I believe happened with Adobe is that when they got it into code, um, in some places, the code requires you to put asphalt emulsion in the Adobe so that it won't dissolve in water. And that kills Cobb. If you stabilize it, um, it becomes a different building material. So um, I'm interested in that possibility, um, but also because of the natural variation in Cobb material, you know, Cobb raw materials from place to place. The idea that we're going to come up with an engineering specification that says um, Cobb is going to have this amount of uh, compressive strength per. Um, per unit uh, volume or surface area, then it's going to have this amount of, who knows? It's going to depend. So I'd be in favor, uh, potentially, of code that does two things. One, for Cobb, that does two things. One is that it allows it to be rewettable, so it's got all those wonderful properties that we like about it is if we want to remodel and reuse. Um, and if the other is, is that it's performance-based, which means that the person who's building their house can mix their own mix and in a very simple or straightforward way demonstrate that it's going to do engineering-wise what they need it to do and take that the data 
to the building department and there's a, it's a section of the code says you will consider the data that's been developed this way by someone who's building with Cobb and make your decision based on that. So that may be the opening that's available for Cobb. But for now, call it something else. <laughs> 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 and the uh, the paper Crete is uh, same thing. It's gaining acceptance. There is a uh, again. There's an organization down in uh, Texas that is striving to get uh, commercial approval for their paper Crete product, primarily because it has gone through all the ballistics testings, all the fire testings, all of the um, earthquake testings, and things that it has to have. And they've been able to source a relatively consistent um, fiber for their product, so they're able to uh, produce a consistent product across the board. So they're striving very hard down there, uh, pushing for commercial code acceptance. So I'd like to, um, as I guess a commercial builder, I'd like to add something about code. So um, code from a standpoint of commercial stick framing and building is um, important because it sets standards on how things can be built, but it does not, as Goldie said, it, it does cost dollars and it does often not make sense. What makes great sense, especially here in Crestone, is you have a wonderful community that supports you, that will teach you how and help you to build what you want and how you want and build it so it doesn't fall down, okay? So... Thank you. I, I'm just going to say, you guys, especially Robin, thank you for your energy and everything that you've done to pathfind uh, this alternative building. All right. We have uh, one more topic that was just brought to our attention that we haven't covered, and Kim would like to cover that for us, and it is insurance. I was going to step my toe into that water, and I chose not to. And she come up and said she wanted to dance in it. And I, <laughs> I said, excellent. Um, I've heard a couple of stories where people have just kind of mm, uh, embellished a little bit of what their structure actually is to get the insurance companies um, to buy into writing a policy for them, which is what you'll need if you're going to mortgage the structure. A lot of us aren't mortgaging our structures, so it's not that important. Um, but in the same vein, I find insurance companies' primary primary goal is to not cover the policy. So anything they can do to not cover it, so embellishing on what you're actually building and then paying an insurance premium is kind of pissing money out the window as far as I can tell. But I think Kim might be able to shed a little bit of light on that for us. And I, I'm, I'll just, yeah. SIPs for insurance, you get a discount. <laughs> Actually, because of the fight, yeah. Fast and easy, you get a, you get a discount. Fast you don't have to call. Fast and easy, you get a discount. You don't have to call Geico. But I'm, I'm really, I am promoting the most innovative, high-performance, affordable, commercial building system. I'm not promoting what they do, all right, and which is, very innovative pathfinding natural building. But that is why we have you here, Tony. Yes. Because it all plays out in the big picture. Yep. It's important. My question was just if any of you have danced with that, and, and I would just share that <laughs> having done some alternative building over the last 30 years, having the second straw bale building built in Chafee County, um, it's a slippery slope. And beyond just getting money, but also just getting... It's kind of like getting alternative medicine approved by insurance, <laughs> which I have a lot of experience with. But what I would say is it's good sometimes to push the envelope to make people more aware of what you're doing, which is you know important that more people know. Obviously, what we're doing is doing that. But um, I know we even had trouble in Arizona with Adobe House, <laughs> which sounds ridiculous, right? I mean, it's traditional, right? Um, but when you show okay, here's a structure, and this structure's been there for this period of time, and it's saved this and that. And I had a couple experiences with that, with insurances. I live in a straw bale here, and lived in Adobe, lived in Flexcrete also, which is another alternative, but um, introducing them to that, because you know some people want to protect their structures in a way, and other people may also need the monies to help support the process, but... I would say 
even in Chafee County 25 years ago, um, you know, building inspector, you know, getting that all approved is always a big hurdle, right? But then once, like you're, like I think uh, maybe Suzanne said, once you get someone to champion that, you know, that you can kind of move move mountains a little easier. So I was just curious if anyone had any other experience. Thank you, Tony, for for sharing that. But thanks, Kim. Yeah, again, I saw a bunch of head nods over there because when you don't have a mortgage and your house isn't is in your house is fireproof I, what are you insuring against <laughs> the earthquake that's going to hit the baca i did get insurance for my straw bales come, come on come on up come on oh okay robin got insurance for her straw bale with farmers liberty. Yeah, and liberty yeah, also story. so for those um, of you folks so when uh, Don retired, he had the little place in the strip mall in Alamosa, and he got insurance for straw bale builders here in the San Luis Valley. And um, there was a little company called Kiowa that he subbed out to to get the straw bale insurance. And then he retired, and they sold to the folks who are now down by Go Jade there, across from ONV Printing. And um, they upped the premium $1,200. And then they started ticking off what else they couldn't insure for the same amount. So I did end up dropping the insurance, but I do believe it was a hopeful moment. If you really need it for some reason, there's a way to get through it. And one of the ways to do it is to look at small companies that do outlying like event insurance, unusual types of insurance that will sub to an independent uh, insurer, which Don was for a long time, although he worked with farmers, he kind of did his own thing for 40 years, right? So look around. Don't go with the big companies and look around for small sub-insurance people who are working for a uh, known firm. And you can find insurance for all kinds of weird stuff, like even the energy festival. <laughs> As Nick did. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. All right. Safe co. Cool. All right. So, can you just announce that Safe Co insures straw bales? Safe Co. Safe Co insuring straw bales. And, and I've heard of a few uh, uh, insurance companies that were insuring earth ships as uh, rammed earth structures as well. Yeah, and so uh, basically the comment was that the uh, they have no historical data on how these products and how these systems are performing. Hopefully we're building that over the last few decades with uh, a lot of the, um, the folks that came before us pioneering these movements. And I think we have some pretty solid data coming. Hopefully they'll start buying in soon. Thank you. Yeah, and in, re in relation to Cobb, I, I, I don't know if specific examples, but there is, it is a historical building process, um, both in the British Isles and in New Zealand. Um, there are many buildings there that have been maintained for a long time, and I'm sure they're insured. So those may be models where you can look to find history, as was mentioned, thank you, um, for to uh, establish a precedent for, for seeking insurance in this context um, or in your context. All right, so I think we're going to try to wrap this up. Are there any other uh, questions floating around out there that you'd like us to address? <laughs> shh, shh, shh. <laughs> okay, everybody, thank you so much. Panel, thank you guys very much. <laughs>